doctor here with us today that's well, you know, very well renowned in, in the Alzheimer's and dementia uh, field. He did a great TV show with me about a month, a month and a half, early October. It's on Acton TV if you want to check it out on YouTube as well. Um, our show is called The <laughs> Healthier You. And uh, it was a, he did a fantastic job. It was 37 minutes of great information. And the purpose today is just to, to update um, you and all of us on Alzheimer's and, uh, and dementia and any new treatments out there, causes and such. Um, Dr. Brett Forrester is the chief of the Division of Geriatric Psychiatry at McLean's Hospital and medical director for behavioral health in the Center for Population Health Management at Partners Healthcare. Dr. Forrester is an expert in geriatric psychiatry, specializing in the treatment of older patients, adults with depression, bipolar disorder, and behavioral complications of Alzheimer's disease and related dimensions. He is a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association and has previously served on the boards of the American Association for Geriatric Psychiatry and the Alzheimer's Association of Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Dr. Forster will share great up-to-date information on Alzheimer's and dementia. As I mentioned, I welcome you, Dr. Forster. Thank you, sir. Time to be here. So what I wanted to do tonight was to talk to you about the epidemic of Alzheimer's disease that we're living through today in our country and frankly around the world, why it exists, how we diagnose the condition today, um, and then hopefully what we can do in the future in terms of preventing the illness, uh, both through biological therapies as well as things that we can do in our own lifestyles that might help to reduce our own risk of developing dementia. Anybody who talks about um, older age issues has to talk about the, um, the aging problem that we're facing um, in, in the world, frankly, not just in America. Um, but the main reason why I always show this slide when talking about Alzheimer's disease is the number one risk beyond family history and genetics of getting Alzheimer's disease is how long we live. It's age. And so what used to be a pyramid of aging back in 1950, where it was rare to see people above the age of 85, we're now just a year away from the rectangle on its side of aging, which is the fastest growing demographic part of our population are those individuals 85 and over. And that, like I said, is the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. About 5% of people in the United States over the age of 65 have some significant memory disorder and that number doubles every five years. So now by the time you get to 85, upwards of 40% or more of people will have a significant memory disorder. That means that more than half or more will not. So the question is why do some go in that direction and others not, and, um, and what can we actually do about it? So I'm gonna first start with a few changes that occur with our, our memory and our cognitive functioning as we get older um, that are normal and then how this is different than what we consider to be a problem in terms of thinking, memory, and, and, our, and our functioning uh, related to that. So in our mid-30s to our mid-50s, um, our brain is actually getting better at quite a few things. We're getting better at processing information, um, and although we may at times start to misplace our keys and our glasses, <laughs> we're actually getting much better in terms of our brain's ability to think and to organize and to plan, what we call executive functioning. Uh, sort of like the executive CEO part of the brain, the frontal lobes, that's getting much more efficient, and that's why um, we often see people taking on more and more leadership roles in this, in this age range. But once we start to get a little bit older than that, um, we start to notice more difficulty with short-term memory loss. And what often first happens is that tip of the tongue phenomenon, where you think you've got the name of that actor that you saw in a movie a few weeks ago, and it's on your tongue, you can't remember it, but it eventually comes back. Um, or it takes us longer to process information, um, and the, and the, and the uh, recall is actually slowed down. That actually happens somewhat normally, and it's frustrating, but it, it actually is pretty much co uh, common, if not universal, um, beyond the age of, eight, of 55. But then we have these two conditions, which we would call abnormal memory loss. Um, and the first condition is called mild cognitive impairment. And the second condition is called dementia. And I'm gonna to try to define them as basically as I can so you can keep these conditions in your mind as we go through the rest of this talk. So mild cognitive impairment, which by the way, both of these 
have been renamed in our new diagnostic manual as of 2000, and for those of you who have medical backgrounds, as of 2015, they've been, they've been renamed mild and major neurocognitive disorder, which I will not say again tonight because it's a mouthful, uh, but they've renamed it because these terms, uh, first of all, there's a fair amount of stigma attached to the word dementia, and it was not terribly specific, and the definition changed a little bit. But let's just stick to these two because I think it's much easier to understand. So mild cognitive impairment generally refers to a decline in cognition. We'll define what I mean by that um, from where you were before. So a decline in memory or your ability to think and organize and plan. But some decline in memory um, and thinking that it's definitely different than the way you used to be. And it's objective and measurable <coughs> through testing. But despite that, people are functioning fine. So we often see people coming into our clinic who are worried about their memory, and when we test them objectively, there is a decline, but they're paying their bills and they're driving. They're still, frankly, working and having normal relationships. Um, that's what we call mild cognitive impairment. And it's hard to diagnose because folks are often fine. They seem fine. They're functioning well. Uh, and as I'll explain to you before, we really need to find people in this stage of the disease of Alzheimer's, as I'll tell you, in order to really have an impact on altering the course of the illness. Um, it's almost like if you think about cancer, if you get cancer after it's metastasized and spread and caused damage to organs, um, it's much, much harder to treat. If you get it in the very early stages, it's much easier to treat. And so think of MCI as being a very early stage form of what may eventually become dementia, which is the decline in cognition, but now there's also an associated change in functioning. So people have difficulty with paying their bills or driving or thinking and organizing or being able to do simple tasks around the house. Unfortunately, and I can't remember now if there's a slide on this, um, but about half of people in the United States with dementia are never diagnosed. And the half that are diagnosed, only about half of those people, um, or ever told of the diagnosis. So we've got a real problem in terms of delayed diagnosis, underdiagnosis, and then not even informing people that they've got the problem. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Stigma, what am I gonna do about it anyway? I don't wanna know about it, denial, minimization, things like that. So we'll, we'll talk more about that. The other thing that's important to remember is that dementia is a global term. I always get this question, so I'll just define it now. Dementia is sort of like a car. And Alzheimer's disease is like, uh, say, uh, a Toyota. It's a type of car. So Alzheimer's disease happens to account for two-thirds of all dementias. And I'll show you pictures of what Alzheimer's actually looks like in the brain. Uh, Alzheimer's actually gets the word from Dr. Alois Alzheimer, who was a German neuropathologist back in the early 1900s. Um, and the first case was described exactly 100 and, um, I guess, 12 years ago this month. Uh, by Dr. Alzheimer. And this was a patient in her early 50s named Auguste who not only was confused and had language problems and had memory loss at a relatively young age, um, but she also had profound suspicions about the hospital staff and about her husband, which is frankly not that uncommon in people with Alzheimer's disease. She died at a relatively young age and he performed an autopsy and he saw these very distinct abnormal protein deposits in the brain called amyloid plaques as well as what are called tangles made out of another protein called tau. Um, and at the time, because she was relatively young, Dr. Alzheimer thought this was a pretty rare illness that presented relatively early in life in a very small number of people. And what was different about 1906 compared to today in 2018 is that you saw the aging demographics, there were very few people who were living beyond the age of 65 because of infectious disease predominantly. And so um, what was thought to be uncommon has now gotten so common because we're living longer. Um, so if you looked at this under the microscope, what you would see are these sticky abnormal protein deposits called plaques made up of this protein called amyloid and these triangular-like shaped tau tangles made up this um, protein called tau. These are inside of the cell and the tau proteins basically stick together and break down the cellular architecture. And these are outside of the cell and cause an inflammatory response and also a degeneration of brain cells. And if you look at the course of illness, these plaques get deposited first and the tau tangles come later on. And I'll show you a slide on this later on, but I think I may as well mention it now. Um, when somebody presents with memory loss and they get evaluated by a specialist and they're diagnosed with Alzheimer's type dementia, 
it's probably the case that there's been about 20 years of deposition of these plaques in the brain before the diagnosis is made. So there's a very long silent period. And we call that preclinical, when there's plaque but no symptoms. And that's where a lot of the research is moving, earlier and earlier in the cascade. And we'll talk more about that. So um, this is last year's slide. But this number is now 5.7 million Americans with Alzheimer's disease. And the scary thing is that that number is supposed to triple by the year 2050. It currently costs the United States $277 billion to care for people with dementia. And a lot of this is the cost of caring for people at home or in long-term care facilities. That's the bulk of the cost. That doesn't even include the cost of time lost to work for the caregivers. That's per year. Guess how much the United States is spending at the federal level on doing research to find causes and treatments for Alzheimer's disease? Any guess? 1.4 billion. So it, it's now over 2 billion. Five years ago, it was 450 million. It's more than quadrupled in the last five years, which is amazing, but it's still way too low. And it lags, well, I hate to compare diseases, but it does lag behind other chronic illnesses. But the reason this is so important, and I always give this example, is um, HIV, which when I was in residency was uniformly fatal illness, caused AIDS, people died, everyone died. And, um, and this is what I saw during my medical internship at Mass General all the time, every single day. And uh, the social movement and the advocacy that led to funding an entire institute at the NIH essentially led to changing HIV from a fatal death sentence to a chronic illness in a relatively short period of time. And up until a few years ago, HIV, which affects about a million Americans, um, gets about $3 billion a year in funding. It was about six times as much as Alzheimer's research up until a few years ago. Um, but that's what happens when the population gets together and really tries to push hard and, and does incredible advocacy work. It's also important to know that of all the top, say, 10 diseases, this is the top six diseases in the United States that lead to death, um, it's the only one in which the prevalence rate, uh, in which the death rate is going up and not down. And then finally, um, those of you who have loved ones with dementia and your family or friends know that this is a disorder that affects the entire family. This is not an illness that only affects the person. And there are over 15 million unpaid family members and friends who are caring for people with dementia. Um, and that doesn't even talk about the economic and the emotional toll it takes on them. So why do people develop Alzheimer's disease? Um, I talked about risk factors. So let me go through some of these. Um, first of all, there are those risk factors which we really can't change. We can't change our age. We can't stop the clock, unfortunately. Um, we also can't do anything today about our genetics. We inherit what we inherit. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about genetics later on. But if you look at this list, hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, smoking, sedentary lifestyle, obesity, a lot of these risk factors for Alzheimer's disease are the same risk factors for heart disease and for stroke. And we know through the Framingham Heart Study and many years of research that a lot of these risk factors, if we reduce them or eliminate them, we reduce the risk of heart attack and stroke. We can also probably reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease by lifestyle modification that reduces those factors. I'll also mention depression. In the last decade, it's become well known now that having a history of depression is an independent risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease when we get older. What we don't know is if we treat that depression effectively and aggressively throughout life with reduced episodes, does that reduce our risk? We don't know the answer. There's some early suggestion in research that it might, but we don't know for sure. Um, alcohol and substance use, um, I'll just mention alcohol. So we know that alcohol, as we age, affects our brain in a much greater way. Alcohol starts to become more toxic at the same levels that it was you know, appreciated and enjoyed at a relatively young age as we get older, our brains can't handle it. And if you've already got those plaques and tangles building up in your brain at the same time you're drinking, then it's sort of like adding a match um, uh, to the gasoline. It really becomes like the brain on fire. And so the symptoms of cognitive impairment um, get worse. And independently, chronic alcohol use can cause symptoms of dementia. Um, I, I put Down syndrome up here just to let folks know that Individuals who are born with trisomy 21 or Down syndrome are living longer because of advances in healthcare, especially cardiac care, 
Um, and what, what unfortunately happens is by the time someone with Downs is in their 40s, every single one of them develops the pathology of Alzheimer's disease in their brain early because of the genetics of this disorder. And that's an area that is almost completely gone under the radar screen in terms of investigation of that population because it's so relatively new that people are living longer and longer. So I mentioned before that Alzheimer's disease accounts for about two-thirds of all dementias. What about the rest of it? Um, so if you look at this long list here, the few that I want to highlight is the first is vascular type dementia. Some people may know the term um, mini strokes or multi-infarct dementia, but it's essentially if you have a loss of blood supply to a part of the brain or a small little clot that affects a blood vessel in the brain and part of the brain dies essentially, you can have a significant and steep decline in thinking and memory and functioning in a really quick period of time. Right after a stroke, someone is not functioning the way they normally do. And if it stays that way and doesn't bounce back, we call that vascular dementia. And what people often describe is a stepwise decline. So they have one stroke and they go down a bit, and then they're flat until another stroke happens, and then they keep going down like that. With Alzheimer's disease, it starts very gradually. Oftentimes, family members can't put their finger on when the symptoms first started, and the course is extraordinarily gradual. Now, the longer someone lives, the more likely it is they have more than one thing going on in their brain at a time. So many people who passed away in their 80s and beyond who had memory problems, if you look at their brains under a microscope, you'll see those plaques and tangles, but you'll also see evidence of stroke illness as well. And when the two combine together, the course is usually more rapid. So it's important to know. Um, this condition, has anyone heard of dementia with Lewy bodies? Yeah, yes. Robin Williams. Yeah. yeah, so Robin Williams, probably the most famous person who has been identified as probably having dementia with Lewy bodies and had a lot of psychiatric symptoms in that setting as well, including depression. This is a Parkinsonian-like dementia. People develop uh, stiffness and rigidity, tremor, shuffle when they walk. Um, but they also are prone to falling. And they have these very vivid and distinct visual hallucinations where they see things that aren't there, like animals or people or babies. They sometimes aren't even bothered by them, but they're more matter-of-factly being described. And they don't generally associate those visual hallucinations with words and noises or music. It's generally not auditory, it's visual. And if you give people like this, and we call visual hallucinations in psychiatry um, a psychotic symptom, if you give people antipsychotic medications, it can actually make the symptoms of the dementia much, much worse. More confused, more unsteady, and, um, and possibly um, no improvement in the hallucinations. So we can talk more about treatment in a little bit. And then the last one I want to mention is frontotemporal dementia. This is a probably maybe 5 to 7% of all dementias. Um, this is an illness that often begins when someone's in their 50s or 60s. It generally does not present with memory loss. It presents with change in personality or behavior or decision making. And it's often, we often get people in psych psychiatric practices where the person is coming in with depression or some kind of behavioral change. And it's not obvious because their memory is pretty good until you do a detailed cognitive assessment that they have this problem. This tends to be a more rapidly progressive problem. And unlike most of the others, <clears throat> the medicines approved for Alzheimer's today, like the Aricepts of the world and Epizil, don't seem to help. In fact, there is nothing on the market for frontotemporal dementia, unfortunately. All right. So that's the bad news. What about the good news? Um, I like to think about when I see somebody who's older with a memory problem or any kind of cognitive problem to figure out what, what, what's going on and what can we do about it, I think about, well, what might be reversible or treatable? What are some of the medical or medication causes of cognitive decline that might not be Alzheimer's but might be treatable otherwise? I mean, that, after all, is the first thing that we think about. Uh, what's causing it and what might be, we be able to improve? So we look for things like um, certain vitamin deficiencies of B12 folate or vitamin D are well known to be associated with cognitive decline. And, and increasingly, it's true that vitamin D in particular is associated with depression in later life. Um, hypothyroidism. So, you know, the thyroid gland controls metabolic functioning like weight and our appetite and our metabolism. Um, underactive thyroid activity can cause cognitive problems that look just like Alzheimer's disease. So part of our workup is to check for thyroid disease. Many people have, with age, chronic medical conditions like diabetes or heart failure or lung disease that, when not stable, can mimic symptoms of dementia. People get quite confused when their blood sugars are going up and down all the time. 
or when they're not oxygenating their brains enough in a setting of heart failure or lung disease. There's a condition um, which is also often treatable called normal pressure hydrocephalus. This is an, an basically an enlargement of these um, fluid-filled spaces in the brain, uh, and that fluid presses on brain tissue and causes cognitive decline and balance problems, risk for falling, as well as urinary incontinence. So that's the triad. Um, and there's a neurosurgical intervention that relieves the pressure by draining the fluid out of those ventricles. This is not a terribly common condition, but when we do brain scans, MRI scans, to look at the structure of the brain, we're not trying to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. We're trying to rule out and exclude other possibly treatable problems, including excessive fluid in these ventricles, causing what's known as NPH. And then Saad knows this, and pharmacists know this, and they can be great resources in helping you understand what medicines your doctor may be prescribing for you that actually make your memory worse. There's actually a long laundry list of these medications. And sometimes you need these medications for other medical problems, but you have to understand it sometimes comes at a price. So there are a couple of classes to be aware of. I always put up Tylenol PM because people often take over the counter medicine unknowingly to help them sleep. So the PM part of Tylenol PM is diphenhydramine or Benadryl. And this is a medication which we know when we get allergic reactions, we take it. Um, even a young person knows if they take too much, they don't think clearly when they wake up the next day. Um, and that's because it's blocking a chemical in the brain that we need for normal thinking and memory uh, called acetylcholine. It's anticholinergic. It blocks the effect of this important chemical in the brain. And in dementia, that chemical activity of acetylcholine goes way down. And the medicines that are on the market, all of them but one, work by increasing that chemical in the brain. So if you have mild dementia and you're on Aricept or Dinepazil and you're taking Tylenol PM overnight to help you sleep, you're basically, you know, those two interact with one another and it's just not a good situation. So we often just check with what people are taking, not just prescribed medicines but over the counter. The other class to watch out for are medications that are prescribed for anxiety like the benzodiazepines, like Ativan and Clonopin and Xanax, and those kind of medications can adversely in, impact thinking and memory. And then there's been a tremendous amount of media attention on the opiate crisis, but pain medications that um, involve opiate analgesics um, taken more than a few doses at a time can really affect thinking and memory. Uh, and we talked about alcohol. All right, so now we're going to do a little bit of a a test. Well, this would be on film. I don't know if it's going to upset you all to um, maybe try to answer some of these questions. So one of the questions is if we need to diagnose this problem earlier and earlier to be more likely to stop the decline, and I'll talk more about that in our research section, um, how are we going to find people with the earliest stages? Because right now, we've got a geriatrician in the back of the room um, who has been screening people for cognitive impairment since the 70s. Um, but most people don't do that. And, and widespread screening is not part of routine primary care. And part of the problem is, is you know, what instrument do we use that's quick and very sensitive, but also specific, so that if somebody scores poorly, they don't get overly worried, or if they score well, they don't get overly reassured. And there is no one gold standard, unfortunately. There is a test, though, called the MOCA, or the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. I'll show you what it looks like in a minute that really allows a clinician in only about 10 minutes to do a pretty detailed assessment of multiple domains of cognition in the office and to just get a sense, is there something not right here? It doesn't give a diagnosis. It gives a sense that something's not quite right and then further evaluation needs to be done from there. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's used to detect even mild cognitive decline and to differentiate what's mild versus more significant. It can take up to 15 minutes, but you know it depends on how someone's doing it. It can be done in as little as 10 minutes. Um, and then it's a 30-point scale. Anything 26 or above is normal, but you know you could have somebody with an, you know, a PhD degree engineer from MIT who scores a, you know, a 29 or a 30, and, and they still could be highly impaired. They're just so high functioning to begin with. These are the eight domains: visuospatial, executive functioning, language, naming, memory, etc. And so I want to show you what this looks like. How many of you have seen or heard of this test before? OK, so good. A few of you have. So the first thing we do is ask people to complete this trails making test. And basically, we're asking people 
to alternate sequence between numbers and letters. It's confusing, actually. We ask people to draw a line from 1 to A and A to 2. You see how it alternates between number and letter? And then we go up from there. So 1 goes to A, A goes to 2, and then where does it go from there? And then where? Yeah. Good. People are either shy or... You guys did a good job. Okay. So you got that. The next one's a cube. Uh, this is a, a test of visuospatial functioning. There's a trick to doing this. If you're not terribly visually, spatially inclined, as this is why I'm not a surgeon, um, I learned the <laughs> trick so I can do it, but otherwise I'd have no idea. And then on, on the right-hand side is a clock draw. So you draw the face of a clock, you put in the, the numbers, and you put the hands at 10 minutes after 11. That tests a lot of things, organization and planning and visuospatial skills. Um, I'm not sure if today's youth are going to know how to do this <laughs> in the future, so... <laughs> Yeah. So that's the clock. So those are tests of executive functioning. Dr. Folstein invented something called the Folstein Mini Mental Status Examination in the mid-1970s, which until recently was the most widely used and gold standard of the cognitive assessment batteries. But there were no tests of this executive functioning on the Folstein Mini Mental. Um, and that was predominantly, I'm not sure why, it worked out that way, but that's a missing item from the mini mental. You don't get at this problem that those frontotemporal dementia patients have, for example, without doing these kinds of questions. Um, then there's naming. What's that? Lion. Right. Some people call that a hippo. Yeah, it's a common mistake. So that's a naming test. Language function often gets impaired in people with dementia. Some dementias earlier than others. And so there's a, there are a lot of detailed naming tests when you go for a more detailed cognitive assessment um, where, where they do things called the Boston naming test, for example. And then to me, this is the most important part of the MOCA because when somebody is developing symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, the primary cognitive problem they have is inability to learn new things. They can't store new information, which is why they repeat themselves all the time because they don't remember having asked the question two minutes earlier. And this is the one test, which is a lot harder than three items. It's five items. Um, when you ask somebody to remember words that mean nothing, it's very hard to do. So there are tricks that you may develop to try to remember them. Um, but the words are face, velvet, church, daisy, and red. When I administer the test, I give all five words, and then I have people repeat them back to me. And then I give them the words again, and I have them repeat them back to me. And then I say, and you get no credit for that, by the way. <laughs> and then you've got to remember them for the next few minutes until I distract you and we get back to it again. All right, so let me give you the five words. Face, face. velvet, church, daisy, and red. Face, velvet, church, daisy, and red. Very good. You got it? Yeah. I could do it again, but you get the idea. All right, we're going to get back to this in a minute. I'm going to distract you now. That's right. You got it. All right, now, there's a test of attention. Um, there's a big difference between memory and attention. Um, if somebody becomes acutely medically ill with like an infection, urine infection really commonly, their attention goes downhill quickly. Um, and they may be otherwise okay, but they can't repeat numbers forwards or backwards. So 21854 forwards or 742 backwards. Seems kind of easy, but if someone has an attentional impairment from an infection or some other medical problem, can't do this. And this is a very sensitive test of attention that's easily done at the bedside. Um, and a lot of general physicians are not trained to do this kind of subtle uh, difference. Um, then we do the uh, repeating a list of letters. This is another attentional task. So I ask people, I give people random letters, and then I ask people to tap their knee or clap their hands when they hear me say the letter A. You have to remember that was the instruction. And then some of the letters sound like one another. So people with hearing problems, you have to be careful because they can not hear this correctly. Like B, A, C, M, N, A, A, J, for example, sounds like A. Um, people who tend to perseverate because they can't inhibit an impulse to hit their knee when they hear something that sounds like it, that, that's an attentional problem as well. And then the subtraction is another attentional task, but some people just weren't good at math. Um, so subtracting 7 from 100, most people get 93, but 7 from 93 is a lot harder. Um, and then we have them go down to 65. 
Uh, and then language, two sentences. I only know that John is the one to help today and the cat always hid under the couch when dogs were in the room. Those are sentences just to repeat back. It's a language test, not a memory test. Um, and then finally, verbal fluency. This is an important test of language and the ability of your brain to engage your frontal lobe and get it out through your language center. And so um, this is a very sensitive test actually to something not quite right. And so we ask people to name as many words that they can in the next minute that begin with the letter F. And I ask them to keep it clean. <laughs> so some people are extraordinarily good and get 30, 35 words. And others, you know, 11 or more is normal. Um, and it's often a really interesting relationship between verbal fluency and what someone's profession was. And even someone who, you can tell someone who's a good writer, a good speaker, somebody who's good with languages, somebody who did something in that area of their work can just unbelievably rattle off these words. And others really struggle, even though everything else is normal. Abstraction. Um, telling the difference between and similarities between two objects. So what we do is we say, how are these two things alike? So I give them an example, how are a banana and an orange alike and it's fruit? But the other ones are train and a bicycle. How are train and a bicycle alike? So, so transportation is the right answer. Movement is not the right answer. This is an abstraction. You have to think about how they're alike. They do both move, but they're also methods of transportation. How about a watch and a ruler? Measurement. Measurement, right, good. And now the words. Oh, come on, they're up there. Okay, what were they? Good job. You got the audiences on top of things. All right, nice job. Okay, now, importantly, if someone misses a word, if somebody misses a word, um, there are two things that I do. Uh, one thing I do is I give them a cue with the categories. So if you miss the word face, I'll say, it was a part of the body. Oh. And if they get it, great. If they don't get it, then I say it was either an arm, a toe, or a face to see if a multiple choice cue helps. Now, the reason we do the cueing is because some people have an inability to learn new information. Alzheimer's patients can't learn new things. I can give them all the hints and the cues in the world, and they'll never get it. That's an Alzheimer's type memory loss. Storage of new information gone. Whereas a category cue, if that works, will point out what's called a memory retrieval problem. In other words, the information is there, you just can't get it out. And that's a subtle difference perhaps, but it's an important clinical difference. And the Alzheimer's type problems are storage problems and the vascular problems are often a memory retrieval problem. And then finally, orientation. A lot of clinicians, primary care clinicians in particular, We'll ask for the day, the day, the week, the month, and the year, and people are fine, but they still may be impaired on other things, and they just never measured it. So anyway, that's the MOCA. Um, how did people try to remember those five words? Did anyone use any tricks? I visualized. You visualized them. Right. So that's a great example of how you use um, visual. Um, People remember pictures much better than random words that have no emotions. Part of this is connected to what's emotionally meaningful. Um, so a lot of people will remember emotional parts of their life that happened long ago, even in moderate to advanced dementia, but they can't remember what they had for breakfast this morning or recognize familiar people. But if you, if you take this and turn it into a story with pictures, that's the way to do it. All right. Now you're all going to pass this test when you're asked about it. Okay, so when people come into our clinic, the single most important thing to do, despite all the fancy tests that we have nowadays, is to get a really good history from the person as well as a family member, somebody who knows them well. Because that collateral information, that, that outside opinion is really important. Um, I can see somebody for a year or two years and just hear what they tell me all the time and then finally their spouse or their adult child comes in, I'm like, I never knew that. And I think one of the problems that we have in psychiatry is that we're so bound up with privacy, which is indeed important, but we have to be able to get information, especially if somebody's aging with these problems, from family members. Um, and so family members, in my mind, are part of our evaluation process always. They really need to be. Um, so the history is critical. The time of onset of the symptoms, how rapidly they've progressed. Um, has it been slow or gradual? Um, or is it all of a sudden? 
We do a basic medical and neurological evaluation, like a physical exam, do the blood work we talked about. And then the American Academy of Neurology recommends that during the workup, there's at least one brain scan done that's a picture of the brain, a structural picture of the brain. So an MRI or a CAT scan will suffice. These are literally pictures of what the brain looks like. It says nothing about how well it's functioning. It just shows areas of atrophy or shrinking or where the strokes are or where there may be a tumor or whether there's an excessive fluid accumulation like in NPH I talked about. So that's the MRI. There's the cognitive testing or neuropsychological testing, which is basically the MOCA, much more detailed, um, where each aspect of cognition, those eight domains, in much more detail. Um, those tests can be an hour or many hours. And we try not to exhaust our patients who can't you know, last for more than a few hours. We try to keep it as short as possible. Um, increasingly, uh, PET scanning is becoming more routine. So what a PET scan is, there are two types. Uh, one is called a metabolic or a functional PET scan. This basically measures brain activity, either metabolism of blood sugar or blood flow, but it's basically brain metabolic activity. And there's a new type of PET scan since 2006 called an amyloid PET scan. It's essentially a way to inject a ligand into your vein, goes up to your brain and binds to amyloid. It literally will light up under the PET scan. So until 2006, the only way to know somebody had those plaques in their brain was to do an autopsy after death, or God forbid, do a biopsy, which I've had at least one patient in my career who had a very bad complication of a brain biopsy, um, which we don't do anymore, thankfully. So, um, but now we have a window into the brain with this amyloid PET scan, and over the last couple of years, there's now a same technology where that tau protein also can light up with a, a tau PET scan. So I'm going to talk more about these with the research stuff. And then finally, genetics. Um, this is really important. Um, a lot of people ask, well, should I know my genetic risk? People know about the company 23andMe and the other companies where now for relatively low cost, you can get your entire genotype done and you can be told your relative risk for different diseases. So APOE4 is a gene that sits on the um, uh, 19th chromosome, 21st chromosome, 19th chromosome. And um, if you inherit one copy from each parent, um, you have two copies of the allele, in other words, your risk of your memory problem being the Alzheimer's type of memory problem is very high. But if you don't have a memory problem yet and you have two copies, it's hard to know. It's more than the general population, but it's not nearly 100%. So if we were to do screening for everybody, it would falsely worry and falsely reassure a lot of people. So we don't. Um, we only use this now in research studies. I guarantee you this will change. We will be doing genetic testing because genetic testing will inform us about who may benefit from new treatments and who won't, or even how to dose possibly new treatments. But right now, today in 2018, if you went in, even for a, a diagnostic evaluation, unless you wanted it, it would not be routinely done, which is probably a good idea. If you're in research, it will always be done. All right. So some people may say, why would I want to know? Yeah. Why would I want to know I've got this problem when there is no treatment in 2018 that will stop this illness from progressing or prevent it from happening in the first place? But there are a lot of reasons to know. And I often, again, I tend to be more optimistic than not in life, um, but I think about what we can do for our loved ones and our patients with dementia, not what we can't do. And instead of just making a diagnosis saying, I'm sorry, it's a horrible illness, um, but this is what you've got. I think about how can we maximize people's quality of life, engage them in meaningful activities, and do what we can to slow down the decline, as well as supporting the caregiver. So knowing early allows people to accept, cope, and understand the illness and plan for their future. When people get diagnosed too late, they have no say in what gets done to them, and that's a huge problem. Not to mention the safety issues, whether it's driving or losing all their money because they got involved in some scam with the lottery, which happens. Uh, people get, older people are preyed on often because of cognitive issues. They can participate in advanced care planning. They can, um, uh, again, they can be involved in how to handle legal and financial arrangements. We have an elder care attorney, for example, in the audience. Uh, but having a conversation with an elder care attorney early on is critical. Um, and then there are things that we can do to prevent slow decline as well as treat. And that I'm going to talk about next. So remember before I talked about
MCI and dementia. And then there's this huge preclinical stage. So here there's amyloid plaque and neurofibrillary tangle and people are functionally impaired. They're not able to drive or pay their bills or work. Here there's memory loss but people are functioning well. And here there's this huge area where people have the disease of plaques and tangles building in their brain but they're completely normal. Every test that we do functioning they're doing fine. And this is a really interesting area because this is like somebody who's got a cholesterol of like 300 and there are no symptoms. But we know now we can do an easy cholesterol test and put them on a statin and they're going to have a much reduced risk heart attack and stroke. But you would never know to do anything unless you got a blood test. And we don't have a blood test for those plaques. We have an amyloid PET scan, but they're extraordinarily expensive and they're not widely available. And no insurance company pays for it yet. So until we have an easy to do biomarker, like a cholesterol test for your risk for heart disease and stroke, we're going to have a really hard time finding out who these people are. Uh, but a lot of money is being poured into this area of research. Um, aging, there's a decline with normal aging. We talked about it. But the decline in dementia is much more dramatic, steep, and happens earlier. So what's on the market now? So um, the first medication that was approved is not even on this slide. But when I was a resident at McLean in the early 90s, a drug called Tacrin or Cognex came on the market. It was the first drug to enhance those acetylcholine levels in the brain. Um, that drug is no longer on the market because it was given four times a day, caused liver dysfunction, and was terribly uh, uh, irritating to the GI tract. Uh, it was also yet to take it four times a day. It was not very easy to take for somebody with memory loss. Um, so when Aricept or Denepazil came on the market in 1996, it took over the market because it was once a day, there was no liver side effects, and although you could develop the GI side effects like nausea, vomiting, and loose stools, the rates were much, much lower, especially if you took it with food. So Dinepazil, which is Aricep, Rivastigmine, which is Exelon, and Galantamine, which is Razidine, those three drugs have been on the market now for over 20 years. And if you look at the data, it's, it's incredibly reproducible data. Every study shows that um, if you put somebody on one of these medicines versus placebo over six months, there's a significant difference in memory performance. That's how the drug got approved. The problem is it's a small difference, and it's very hard to tell. Just having a casual conversation, you can't tell. Um, and so a lot of people will say, well, it's not helping my mom. And the problem is, is if you stop it, and this is what the study showed and what we see all the time, is that those people who were higher for six months crash down to the level they would have been immediately without the drug in a very short period of time, almost like there's a, an abrupt decline. So, when I prescribe these medicines to patients, talk to the families about it, the goal is not cure. The goal is slowing decline for a period of time. That period of time could be six months, it could be two years. We don't have randomized trials with the placebo group beyond six months because of ethical reasons. But we do have anecdotal evidence in our own clinical practices and long-term studies that didn't have a placebo group that have showed people who do well for years on these medicines. And the question always is, well, would they have done fine without the medicine? And some people, sure, they probably would have done fine, but others would have done much, much worse. And since we can't tell which, who falls into what group, they get prescribed for all people who want to take them, who can tolerate them. And now, luckily, they're all available generically, so the price has dropped um, quite a bit. Um, important to know is that rivastigmine comes in a patch, uh, the Exelon patch, and it's absorbed directly into the um, bloodstream. So that means it bypasses the stomach, and really there are no... Uh, the gastrointestinal side effects are not noted, which is really important. Um, and then there's another drug called Memantine or Nemenda. This drug was approved in 2003, and it was the last drug approved by the FDA for dementia 15 years ago. 15 years ago. So that is a big part of the problem. Now, this works on a different chemical in the brain called glutamate. There's too much glutamate in the brain of people with dementia. It can cause toxicity to brain cells. And this helps to modulate the amount of glutamate that gets transmitted across the neuron. So today's standard of care, 15 years into having these drugs available, is combining memantine with one of these three, indefinitely. Now, you could talk to 10 primary care doctors, and more than half would probably say, I've never seen anyone really benefit from these medicines. And you could talk to specialists who would say, most of my patients do well on these medications. Um, so, I, it, again, in, in 2018, they've remained the standard of care, but the expectations are slowing decline for a period of time um, and not cure. 
So that's important to remember. And the reason for this is none of these drugs attack those plaques and tangles. These drugs basically help the brain years after those plaques and tangles have already been destroying brain cells. So what are we going to do about that? Well, luckily, there's been a lot of investment. Now, finally, the federal government is catching up. But the original research back in the 80s and 90s that identified these, <coughs> these um, targets in the brain that we could finally um, address, amyloid and tau, um, have led to tremendous numbers of um, products that have been developed by pharmaceutical companies and biotech. And frankly, you may or may not know this, but Boston, Cambridge in particular, is frankly at the center of the world in terms of developing a lot of these compounds and studying them in trials. It's really around our corner. And we'll talk about some of the research we're doing at McLean with some of these products. But essentially, there are two types of treatments. So one would attack the amyloid plaque and the other would attack the tau tangles. The amyloid research is about a decade or so ahead of the tau research. And so far, every single anti-amyloid study has completely failed. And the main reason for why we think they've failed is because we've introduced the medicine too late. We've introduced the medicine after people can no longer drive or pay their bills, or there's some degree of functional impairment, and there's too much damage to brain cells. It'd be like giving somebody a statin after the fourth heart attack and expecting the heart to function better. You might prevent the fifth heart attack, but you're not going to help the heart function better. So the research has moved much, much earlier in the disease course. And that actually has provided a lot of hope. So let me show you what these amyloid scans look like and the, and the other scans. So first, let me show you what a metabolic scan looks like. This is a PET scan which is looking at brain activity. So here, a normal metabolic scan will be lit up in red. So you see the areas of the brain that are lit up in red there. But in Alzheimer's disease, the red is gone. See that? There's a massive reduction in brain activity in Alzheimer's disease because of widespread damage to brain cells and death of brain cells. So that is actually a scan that we've had at our fingertips for decades in, in certain centers. And the federal government pays, Medicare will pay for a PET scan if the doctor is wondering if it's the Alzheimer's type of dementia or the frontotemporal type of dementia <coughs> because the course of illness is different. And as I mentioned, the treatment's different. But the amyloid scan has really changed the way. It's our first real biomarker that we can see into the brain without taking part of the brain out and looking under the microscope. And so a normal uh, amyloid scan um, uh, is here. And if you look at, so you see purple, but you see no yellow and you see no orange, essentially. But look at all the yellow here. And that's, that's basically the amyloid lighting up when that ligand binds to it. And so what we can do now is when we bring somebody in for a research study, in order to get into these studies, people have to have evidence of cognitive decline. They have to be otherwise pretty healthy. And they have to have amyloid in their brain. Because these antibodies bind to the amyloid and essentially remove them from the brain. There's another type of treatment which held out the promise of preventing the buildup in the first place. Uh, that was a type of uh, compound called beta secretase inhibitors. They basically inhibited an enzyme that led to the production of this. Just recently, like a month ago, uh, at an international Alzheimer's meeting, um, I think the world, the community of Alzheimer's research, researchers have realized that that treatment approach is not going to work. Um, these drugs don't seem to be helpful, but even worse, they seem to make things worse. Um, they lead to perhaps shrinking of the brain in the areas where memory is stored, and they may cause psychiatric side effects like agitation. So I don't think we're going to be seeing a lot more drug development for that class, but we are seeing a lot for the antibodies that bind to amyloid and remove it for, from the brain. And I'll, I'll give you this example. And this is probably the most hopeful example. So this is a drug here called aducanumab. It's a long word. It has no other um, brand name yet. Um, in the phases of drug development, you go from phase one in um, essentially healthy people just to see if it's safe, in phase two in a small number of people with Alzheimer's disease, and in phase three with a huge number of people with Alzheimer's disease. Um, in the first trial that this company did and published the results a couple years ago, they demonstrated that if you give this drug to somebody with mild cognitive impairment or mild Alzheimer's disease in the early stages, you not only removed amyloid from the brain, but you actually slowed down the decline. There was a significant change, drug versus placebo. And they studied in a very small number of people, like 166 people. Got a lot of attention around the world. 
and Biogen, which is located here in Cambridge, decided to invest mightily in this compound. <clears throat> and they now are doing two identical phase three, the final phase before approval, trials with about 3,000 patients. We've been involved in the study for a couple of years at McLean and recruited people and been following them. But this is what they found. See in red here, that's all that amyloid in red and amyloid in red. So this is at baseline and a year later for people on placebo. But if you look here, for the people getting three milligrams per kilogram per day, this is um, compared to baseline, it goes away. And it's six milligrams and it's, it's completely gone at 10 milligrams. So it's been just shown, not just with this drug, but with a few others, that if you give one of these antibodies to patients with early stage disease, it does indeed remove plaque from the brain. The question is, does it matter? Does it alter the course of illness? And that's what we're trying to figure out right now. And um, about a year from now, the final patient who was enrolled in this study in February of this year, the final patient will be done with their 18-month study. And so about a year from now, maybe early 2020, late 2019, we'll probably hear a massive press release whether this study was a success or not. If it's successful, it will change everything because it will be the first what's called now a DMT, a disease-modifying therapeutic. And there are none yet that are approved in, uh, for Alzheimer's. So keep your ears out for about a year from now uh, for what ha happens with this trial. <clears throat> so in terms of research, um, like I mentioned, Boston is a hub of Alzheimer's research. And at McLean Hospital in Belmont, we've been involved for about eight or nine years in many studies of compounds like this. Uh, this is about the third or fourth trial, and we have two others going on as well. So we're currently recruiting for people who are in the very earliest stages of Alzheimer's and mild cognitive impairment for other kinds of studies. We're doing another anti-amyloid study, because this one's closed now, but we're doing another anti-amyloid study, and we're doing a study with an anti-tau compound as well. And so in the information that we have, it's contact info, et cetera. So just as an FYI. OK, the final part of this talk is, so what can you do uh, in terms of healthy brain aging? Um, we found that when I've spoken to audiences like this over the years, there's a lot of interest in this area. There's a lot of misinformation in this area, et cetera, but there's a lot of interest. And so we created a course. It's called the SHAPE course. And we're holding it now at McLean, but also we're going out into long-term care communities around here in the Boston area. Um, it's six weeks. It's an hour per session. And we have a handout about that as well if anyone's interested in taking it. It's basically my talk tonight is part one. And then we go into depth on most of what I'm going to tell you now in the next five minutes over the course of six weeks so in a lot more detail. So the first is nutrition. And I would say <clears throat> there, there are about three or four things that you can do to help with brain aging. One is nutrition. Two is exercise. Three is keeping busy, active, cognitively active, and socially interactive. Um, those are sort of the, the keys to successful aging. I am not a nutritionist, but in our course, we have a nutritionist to talk about this in more depth. But basically, the Mediterranean diet, of all the diets out in the world, is probably the one that's most likely to help reduce the onset or reduce the risk of developing a significant cognitive problem. And in the Mediterranean diet are foods <clears throat> that are antioxidant. These reactive oxygen species attack um, our body and our, our cells and are, are terrible for our heart and our brain. Um, and they're also anti-inflammatory. You know, there's inflammatory processes to so many chronic illnesses. Alzheimer's is one of them. So the Mediterranean diet, and there have been other diets like that, um, have been studied in, in, in numerous trials. The most interesting one for me that I saw, because, you know, everything that's good for your heart is good for your brain in terms of food. Um, and so there was a study that was done where they compared a Mediterranean diet with just a low-fat diet, so also a pretty good diet but not the same anti-inflammatory and antioxidant uh, potential. And it was done in Spain, and they actually were looking at stroke and heart attack as the outcome. And they stopped the study early, because the group on the Mediterranean diet was doing so much better than the group on the uh, low-fat diet that it was too dangerous and unethical to continue. So I do think, if you believe that protecting your um, heart and, your, and risk for stroke will also help protect your brain, which most scientists do now believe, uh, the Mediterranean diet is probably your best bet. Um, I'm happy to take all your questions at the end about nutraceuticals and vitamins and this and that. Uh, but the bottom line for any of that research is that the National Institute of Aging has come out with a statement about a year and a half, two years ago, that there is no one thing that you can take 
and a pill that will help prevent you from developing dementia, or if you have cognitive problems, will slow it down. There have been plenty of positive studies, but there are many negative studies, and it's confusing literature. Um, but everyone will tell you multiple anecdotes where they've seen miraculous effects, and I'm happy to answer any questions. But that's sort of like the official word. All right, I'm going to just... So exercise, even more than diet, in the literature that I've now become familiar with, I think exercise is probably the most beneficial in terms of risk reduction. And it doesn't have to be training for like a marathon or a 100-mile uh, bike race. But exercise at midlife, in women in particular in this one study, reduces the risk of dementia later in life. And it's generally 30 minutes of aerobic exercise three or four times a week, getting to about 70 to 80% of your maximum heart rate. Um, do you know how to calculate your maximum heart rate? Yeah. So you take the number 220 and you subtract your age, and that's your maximum heart rate. So if you get to like 70% of that sustained for 30 minutes, three times a week, that's the kind of exercise that most of these studies are looking at. That's sort of a rough rule. They've also looked at resistance training, including weightlifting, um, which can also be important. Well, now, what, what does exercise do? In animal studies and in some human studies, it seems that it may actually promote the growth of new brain cells. And it may even reduce the amyloid plaque buildup in the brain that we see in people who are destined to develop dementia. So there are a lot of reasons why exercise can be helpful. And in a study that was published a year ago um, by the Lancet Commission, they wanted to know what would happen if we started to eliminate some of these risk factors from our lives. How would it affect the risk of dementia worldwide? And they predicted through incredibly advanced modeling, statistical modeling, that if in early life we improved education, and in midlife, we reduced hearing loss, which is an interesting one, hypertension, obesity. And in later life, eradicated smoking, social isolation, physical inactivity, diabetes, and depression, we could eliminate about a third of all cases of dementia from around the world. And as you look at all these things, most of these are modifiable risk factors. And there's a, so again, there's a lot you can do to improve um, or to lower your risk of developing dementia. There's a lot of interesting research on sleep and dementia risk. And so a lot of folks who have sleep disorders, like sleep apnea or restless leg syndrome or some other sleep disordered breathing problems, um, are noted to have increased risk for a whole host of medical problems, including dementia. And even for people who don't sleep enough and seven to eight hours of sleep a night, and I am not a great example of healthy sleeping habits um, because I wake up early to exercise and I try to figure out what's better or worse for my brain. But seven or eight hours of sleep a night is recommended, and less than that in certain animal studies has been shown to be associated with excessive production of, of amyloid. All right, so none of this takes rocket science, obviously, but these are tips for successful aging. And the problem is, you can't prescribe any of these in a pill. Mm -hmm. And um, we talked about the healthy brain and heart diet is associated with a better, you know, lower risk for dementia and successful aging. And you know, we can talk about minimizing stress all we want, but how are you going to go about doing that? You know, sometimes it's helpful to have a coach or a trainer or a therapist or a loved one, but there are ways that we need to plan fully act on reducing and minimizing stress in our life. Dr. Gary Small, who was once at MGH and now is at UCLA, has a wonderful book, uh, which has to do with preventing Alzheimer's disease. Um, he had a book earlier called The Memory Bible, but talks about mental and physical aerobics. So a lot of people talk about exercise, we, we mentioned, but there are, there's probably billions of dollars being spent right now by Americans on brain games through your computers and apps on your phone. Lumosity is an example for, um, as one of these apps. These can be very helpful in improving brain function in certain domains, but what people have not yet figured out is whether or not doing better on the game will actually translate to your life. And that's the real missing link in the research. So that's why I think a lot of us have been cautious about over-promising from brain games. However, the basic point is that if you try something new, that's helpful. If you do the same thing over and over again, like I've given this talk a lot, you can tell. <laughs> If I keep giving this talk, it may or may not help my brain, <laughs> except your questions will keep me on my toes. But if, if I try to learn a new language, 
or actually try to do something that I'm not good at, the visuospatial stuff, that actually is a great way to exercise your brain. Some people just say, well, I'll just do crossword puzzles, which is great. Some people cannot do crossword puzzles. That would just frustrate you. That may not be the best brain game for you. Um, so finding the right mental aerobics is critical. This is huge amongst the current cohort of, say, World War II generation folks and the older baby boomers. It's mostly men, but increasingly women. Retirement is a huge problem. Actually, today I had a, a conversation with a patient in the hallway, a, a spouse of somebody was there. We were just chatting. I said, how's it going? He goes, I'm retired. I got all the time in the world. He goes, it's really not that easy. Um, so I think planning for retirement is really important. I think going into retirement, if you've been busy, if you've identified your, yourself from what you do in life, and then there's nothing, that's the problem. Uh, and a lot of folks struggle with that. Risk for depression, risk for cognitive issues, social isolation. And then the bottom ones here, really critical, maintaining social relationships. There's been a tremendous amount of research that the nature and the quality and depth of someone's social relationships predicts better outcomes. The better the social relationships. If you combine, like if you could wake up early in the morning one day and meet a bunch of friends on the street corner to go running or go to the gym, then you can get your social interaction and you can get your, and your exercise in and you just gotta work on your sleep. Um, <laughs> attitude is key. So. A lot of folks see the world as half, uh, as, as you know, the glass half empty as opposed to half full. What I think about this is there's a difference between the way one looks at the world and then negativity that happens in depression. When people are depressed, they think negatively, and it's a state of mind. It's not the way they are. It's just the way they are now because of the syndrome of depression. So there's a difference between someone's view on life and when someone develops depression. So we need clinically to diagnose and treat depression. But the way in which we look at things, a lot of people can be experiencing the same difficulties in their lives with losses and illness and have a very different attitude than somebody else. And then finally, um, if problems with memory are noticed, they should be um, dealt with early on and not minimized, denied, or, and it's, again, easier said than done. So in summary, before we get to the questions, um, <clears throat> more and more now that we have these early interventions that we now know are critical, uh, at least in research, uh, diagnosis earlier and earlier is becoming more and more critical, um, especially with the aging of the population and with the advent of these disease-modifying therapies. Um, our current treatments are symptomatic for a period of time, but they focus on slowing down cognitive decline, functional decline, as well as improving behavioral symptoms. And I should mention that most of my research is on the behavioral symptoms of dementia. And I barely talked about this, but I'm happy to if you would like to in the question and answer. But I'll say one thing is that when somebody with dementia experiences a course of illness, say over 10 years or longer, nearly 100% of them will have some psychiatric complication. Anxiety, worry, depression, aggression, and violence. Really <coughs> common. Paranoia, delusions. These symptoms are why loved ones burn out. This is why caregivers are overwhelmed and stressed. This is why people wind up in hospitals and long-term care facilities earlier than they would otherwise. And the good news is these are treatable problems. They're very treatable problems with medicines, with behavioral interventions, and usually the combination. And a lot of our research is looking for novel ways to treat these problems that are safer and more effective, especially the more severe problems. And then finally, um, the goal of treatment is really <clears throat> twofold. One is quality of life and safety. Pretty basic. Um, a lot of people will if you have a discussion with a confusing situation where somebody is agitated, irritable, combative, confused, and you're talking about risks of medications and hospitalization, you can really bring it down to the basics by just saying, my goal here is to keep mom or dad or my spouse you know, with a, as good a quality of life and to keep them safe. And I usually use that as a, as a framework for thinking about how to talk to folks about treatment. Um, and then finally, um, and we're trying to enhance independence. You know, the hardest thing that I do often is telling people they can't drive. A lot of doctors won't take that on because they're not mandated to do so in this state. Some states they are. Um, but it's really important to take the family out of the bad guy role and have the physician address the problem. Um, and then prevention is critical, not just with diet and exercise, but these research studies, we're going to see more and more of this. And, um, and hopefully this will lead to... Uh, uh, promising reductions um, in development of dementia over time. I'll mention one other thing. Um, the Alzheimer's Association, some of you have been involved with them over the years. I've been on their board for many years. I've done a lot of volunteer work and fundraising for them. 
uh, they are the single best go-to place for information about this illness. Um, they have their local, our statewide offices are in Watertown, actually now in Waltham, right near McLean, right off of Trapello Road. They're lovely, wonderful people. They have incredible resources, not just support groups, but education. They interact with people with dementia. They've been focusing increasingly on people who developed this illness earlier in life because that's a population that is less understood how to manage those problems. And then um, they're also involved in funding research. And if you wanted to go to one place to know like what study might I or a loved one be um, you know, available to do, you could look at their trial match website. Um, anyway, this information's here. We'll take the um, handout with your emails and send you the slides if that works. So I'm going to stop there and answer any questions that you guys have. So the question was, um, what is the cost of a standard workup for somebody with dementia? So there are a couple parts of this question. The first part is, who does a workup? And so in our field uh, of medicine, this has been um, hotly debated. The specialists who understand dementia include neurologists, geriatric psychiatrists, geriatricians, uh, and then many primary care doctors who are adept and skilled at treating older adults can also do this. And frankly, for us to actually assess and manage all the you know, on, oncoming numbers, um, all medical clinicians are going to have to know some of the basics. The good news is insurance covers pretty much all of this. This is standard medical care. Uh, Medicare will cover it. Secondary insurance will cover it. Most people will have coverage even for neuropsychological testing for the more detailed battery, which not everyone needs. MRI scans are covered as long as there's a medical need for it. And even a PET scan to look at metabolic activity is covered if there's a reason to get it. Um, the one thing which is not covered is the amyloid PET scan. In, I think it was February, this study that the federal government ran, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services ran, it's called the IDEAS trial. They enrolled over 18,000 people where the clinician, who was a dementia expert, suspected a memory problem, but didn't know if it was Alzheimer's or something else. And so in that study, their question was, if we had amyloid PET scan data, would it change our diagnosis or our treatment approach? And that study is now done. And the early indication is that it definitely changes diagnosis. Most likely, it will change treatment. The question is, will it impact their decision to cover it or not? And right now, a scan's between six and $7,000. And they're not available everywhere. So again, the technology has to be cheaper, but also we need better biomarkers. We need biomarkers that are less invasive. That, that's not invasive, but less time consuming, more widely available, and much, much cheaper. But it's, the bottom line is these are covered services. So the question was about lithium as a potentially neuroprotective agent in reducing the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So most of you know lithium is a salt. It's one of our essential elements. It's actually been approved in the United States to treat bipolar disorder since the 1970s. Groundbreaking treatment. Still widely used today and tremendously effective. There was a study that came out a couple of years ago, I believe it was in Europe, that looked at the relationship between lithium and water levels naturally and risk of Alzheimer's. And the risk was much lower. Then there was another study that came out about a decade ago where they had patients with bipolar disorder who had been on lithium versus those with bipolar disorder who had never been on lithium, and they died, and they looked at their brains. And the patients who had been on lithium had one-sixth the rate of amyloid and, and tau tangles in their brain as the people who had never been on lithium. So there's a lot of but, you know, cross-sectional study, et cetera. So there's a lot of interesting information that does support the neuroprotective hypothesis. The problem with lithium is it's a terribly toxic drug when not used correctly. It causes kidney failure, thyroid dysfunction, and electrolyte imbalance, and it's very dangerous. So you wouldn't want to give it to everyone, but in teeny little micro doses, you know, who knows? Yeah, like so, water supply. yeah, so there's never been a definitive study to show whether it prevents dementia or treats it. We are actually involved in a lithium study for people with Alzheimer's, but not to prevent cognitive decline, but to treat the agitation. Just like lithium treats agitation and mood instability and bipolar disorder, it likely also has similar effects, but never before shown in Alzheimer's disease. So we're part of a multi-center NIA-funded study trying to answer that question. The question is whether a mini-stroke is noticeable clinically. Um, and sometimes yes, sometimes no. So some people will have an acute episode where there's a notable neurological finding. They develop weakness or tingling in a limb, 
or they have difficulty with slurred speech, or they have visual deficits. Um, and then that's associated with a change in the brain, where you see, a, a, say, a white spot on the MRI. And that, that's what is sort of a small stroke, basically, or a mini stroke. But some people have them silently. They have no symptoms. And you get an MRI of their brain, and there are white spots all over the place. Now, some people will call that mini strokes as well. The problem is that just having the white spots there with no symptoms is kind of a nonspecific finding. Because even aging alone, you see the white spots. Not in everybody, but in some people. If you see white spots in the MRI and there's cognitive problems, there's probably some relationship there. Mm -hmm. And then what most people don't know is that people who develop depression for the first time in later life may be getting depression, not because they lost a loved one, or because they retired, or because they're having financial struggles, but it may be related to their overall health and specifically the presence of these small white spots in the brain. And we call that vascular depression. And people with vascular depression are frustrating people to live with. They have no interest in motivation in doing anything. They're like, lie on the couch and they've got the remote control in their hand as their best friend. And they have um, no energy. And they, when you ask them if they feel depressed, they don't say, I'm not sad or hopeless. I just don't feel like doing anything. And when you test their memory, their memory is usually pretty good, but they can't do the executive functioning tasks on the MOCA. And a lot of those folks, we believe, have a vascular cause of this depression syndrome, which we call vascular depression. And it's often people who never had depression before, but starts in later life due to vascular pathology. A lot, geriatric psychiatrists have been aware of this syndrome for a couple decades, but it's not widely recognized in the rest of the medical field. So the question is whether the APOE4 allele test is reimbursable by insurance or whether it's even clinically useful. So um, as I mentioned before, um, in terms of its utility, as a widespread screening tool for the population, it's not helpful because you will reassure some people and falsely worry other people. Um, but if you have a memory problem, and there's a question if it's the Alzheimer's type, especially if a first-degree relative, like a parent, had that illness and they got it relatively young, like in their 50s and 60s, then it would likely, if it were positive, be the Alzheimer's type of dementia. The question is, does that even matter? Because it wouldn't change our treatment today. But in the future, one of the drugs we're studying that I showed you, that aducanumab, it turns out if you've got both copies of APOE4 and we raise the dose too quickly, you're likely to get the bad side effect from this drug, which is brain swelling and brain hemorrhage, bleeding. But if you go up slowly, you don't have that same problem. In a person without the APOE4 allele, you can go up quicker. So knowing genetics matters for dosing for that drug, and that's where genetics will likely matter in the future. In terms of reimbursable, you can pay for um, relatively inexpensively your entire genome to be sequenced by companies that will include the APOE4 allele. Um, insurance may or na may not pay for it if there's a medical reason, like the doctor says, I'm not sure if it's the Alzheimer's type, but I think that will depend greatly on what kind of insurance, and I don't know if Medicare pays for it, to tell you the truth. Right. So the question was side effects of gabapentin that can cause cognitive impairment or memory loss. So gabapentin is actually an anti-seizure medication. It goes by the brand name Neurontin. It's been on the market for seizures for probably 20 years. Interestingly, this medication also treats neuropathic pain, and it's really good at reducing anxiety. And it's never gotten any approval for that. Um, and some people take it off-label for that, by the way. Um, so gabapentin at dosages greater than whatever it may be, everyone's different, but at higher dosages can indeed cause cognitive side effects and balance problems, confusion. Um, so it's something to be aware of. So if you're on this medicine for pain or seizures or even anxiety and you're above even 900 milligrams a day or 600 milligrams a day, again, the older you are and the more fragile your brain, the more likely those side effects could occur, then if there's a relationship between being on the drug and more confusion, it's worth cutting the dose back, talking to your doctor about it and seeing whether or not it might be related. And by the way, and that's an obvious one, and Benadryl's an obvious one. But there are many drugs out there that should not necessarily cause cognitive side effects. But if you start a new drug for whatever, and within a week or two you're just not thinking or, or feeling right, it most likely is related. And it's worth talking to your doctor about that, even if it doesn't seem right. I'll give you another example, statins. Why in the world would statins cause cognitive problems? But people usually ask this question. Um, there's many uh, patients I've seen over the years who are convinced the statins were the cause of the cognitive problems they're having. It's known to cause all sorts of side effects with liver and muscle problems, but 
The cognitive issue is, is sort of one of those, we don't know, we don't know. I believe it's probably true for some people and there's probably really good biological explanation, but um, again, any new medicine with a change should certainly be investigated. Thank you so much for all your attention. Today.